morning, everybody. So I'm just start off saying I'm super excited. So if you don't know, I grew up here. Um, I was the little hellion that all churches have running around the halls, getting picked on like people by like Jimmy and uh, Jim White and different people like that. That was me. If you can imagine me running around the halls, that was me. So it's a lot of fun for me when I get to co- get asked to either preach for Chad at youth group or when my father-in-law is out of town and says, hey, do you want to preach for me while I'm out of town? I always get so much excitement out of it because I love doing this. I mean, I went to Johnson University, Florida to do stuff like this, so it's just so much fun. But we're getting into it. It's a new year, right? How many of you made New Year's resolutions? Raise your hand. Yes. Two for two, and I'm loving it. First service, no one raised their hand either, and it brings me pure joy to see because... We all know, guess what's probably not going to happen? <laughs> that New Year's resolution, that's why I don't make them. Everybody always asks me, like, Zach, what's your New Year's resolution? Don't got one. Why? Because it's not going to happen. And, or it's the same thing every single year. Like mine, I'm going to stop drinking Mountain Dew and I'm going to drink more water. Guess what hasn't happened? <laughs> I drink more water, but I haven't stopped drinking Mountain Dew. As much as my wife would give her left arm for me to stop doing it. It's, it's my coffee. It's how I start my day or just get that energy boost. But why don't we do them? That's always the thing. Is it, well, my heart wasn't in it or this or that. It's probably just because at the end of the day, it takes work, right? When someone says, I'm going to start going to the gym more. And if you ever gotten a gym membership in January, you go to the gym, that place is packed. Like, Grace and I had it for a little while, and we would know January through January, the first two weeks of February, we just didn't go. Because it's either you're going to go in, you're going to be waiting for the bench press or the treadmill, and you're like, I just want to work out. Why am, I, why am I waiting for the treadmill? But it's by February, second week of February, it's empty. You're like, wow, what happened? And it's because working out is terrible. I don't know if anybody's done it. It's not fun. Like going to, especially if you're like waking up and driving to the gym to then sweat and curse at yourself in your head because you're like, why am I doing this to myself? And then go home and shower and then the next day you're like, ow, ow. <laughs> because it's, it's just not fun. I think that's why a lot of people give up working out. Or if you, let's say you, you say, I'm, this year I'm going to be tighter with money and I'm going to stick to my budget. And then for some people, it's just like, for me, oh, a new video game system comes out. I think I can fudge that budget. Just move some money around. It's, we just don't stick to it. And I don't know why, I don't know, but I think New Year's resolutions, as much as it's good because it leads us to reflect on our last year and maybe some things we would like to see changed, there's not much going into the new year because guess what happens? Life happens. If you can look at 2020, that was a rough year. There's some good of it. Like I know for me and my family, I got to welcome my firstborn son into the world in 2020. So 2020 will always be a good year for me, regardless of how much bad there was. But you try to look at the year before and say, I'm moving on. Let's get some of the new things. So here we are into a new year. But I think we look at the wrong stuff. Yes, losing weight, if you need to lose weight or be tighter with your money or have more time spent with family or doing hobbies is important. And that's good because you need to take care of yourself that way. But we tend to look at things that at some point isn't going to matter. At one point or like, you're not going to be able to take your money with you. At one point, you're not going to be able to work out anymore just because either you hit that age or you had an injury and you just can't. And you're going to have to stop looking at those kind of things. But there is something that is going to take us past this life we're in now. And that's what we should be looking at all the time. So... When we're coming into a new year, why doesn't anybody ever say, well, I'm really going to step up my faith this year? Or I'm going to join a small group and I'm going to be there every single week and all of this. Why isn't that something we hear? Because just like I'm going to go to the gym or I'm going to save money, life happens, right? You have all the intentions to do these things, but something happens. And especially now, if you look at our society, the Christian faith is being attacked more than it ever has been. And they are not going to come out and blatantly say, hey, this is what we're doing. But it is happening. So why aren't we focusing on our faith more now than ever? 
with so much craziness as is going on. And this idea of looking at your faith, if you saw the sermon bumper, you're going to guess we're going to be talking about what is it truly meaning to be a true disciple of God, and what does it mean to do discipleship? And these are really important things. Like, I love talking about discipleship. That's kind of why I've stepped into the role of the life group minister, leader, or however you pronounce my title. I don't even know. I'm in charge of small groups because I love this stuff. I think this stuff is so important in our everyday lives that it needs to be talked about more, and sometimes we don't. So you can probably guess, like if you've ever heard a sermon about discipleship or read a book about discipleship, what verse I'm going to. It has a fancy title that we've given it, and it's right before Jesus ascends back to heaven, and it's called the Great Commission, but it is, I still think, the epitome of what we need to look at and live by. We can give it a fancy title, or we can say, yeah, of course, I know that verse, but we don't always live by it. In Matthew 28, 18 through 20, it says this, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. We know this verse. If you've been in the church for your whole life or some years or even new, you've probably have already heard this verse. It's super simple, but I think sometimes we take this verse and we miss something that's so key when it says, go and make disciples of all nations. It means everybody. But it means something more when you look at it. It doesn't mean just make converts. I think when you think go and make disciples, you think, well, I brought a friend to church. They're getting baptized. I'm good. I did what I'm supposed to do. That's not what this verse is real meaning because when you're baptized, that's what you need to do. Please don't misunderstand me. That is the right thing to do, but that doesn't automatically make you a disciple of Christ. Discipleship is something completely different than believing and recognizing that belief and getting baptized. Discipleship takes time, it takes effort, and it takes more than just saying, Lord, be the leader of my life. So we need to first make, stop thinking just making converts as being a disciple. And that's part of it because we're told to go and get people to come to Christ and baptize them. But there's more than just that. And I think sometimes when we look at it, we look at the church of, yes, we're filling the church. We have all these people here. The seats are filled. We got 30, 40, 100 people looking, watching on Facebook Live. Hi, everybody on Facebook Live. But that's not what's important. Jesus is looking for that quality, that quality of believers and people in his life. I've said this in first service, and Chad took some shots, but how many of you like baseball? A lot more than I expected. I feel sorry for all of you, (laughs) because baseball's terrible. If you want to watch a good sport, watch soccer, or rugby, because those are good sports. Baseball is is just, it's boring. All you do is you hold a piece of shaped wood, and you swing at a ball, and you hope you hit the ball. And no one cares about how many times you hit the ball or how many times you got on a base. They only care about, did he get home? And you could be the best or the worst baseball player, but if you didn't get home, you didn't do your job. You didn't do your one purpose. And you people say, well, a baseball player is supposed to help their teammates and get their teammates home. Sorry, no. If you're on standing at home base swinging at the ball, your goal is to get back there. And if you don't, yeah, you may have had eight hits in the game, but you didn't do well. You didn't get home. You, so you didn't do the quality. You just had quantity. And I think that's what it looks, we need to look at when it comes time. Sorry, Chad, I told you I'd get you back. It doesn't, we need to look at when they were being disciples and discipling other people. What is the quality level at? That needs to be the first thing in our minds is the quality level needs to be more than just, I brought 30 people to church this year. That's awesome. Please keep doing that. But that's not what the thing, and that's not the thing we need to focus on. In Matthew 10, 24, 25, it says, The student is not above the teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for students to be like their teachers and servants like their masters. And the word here is obviously, it says in the verse, it says it's a student or it's a learner. But if you look it up in the Vines Dictionary of the New Testament, it will translate it to someone who follows another's teachings. It takes it to another step. You can be a student. I mean, we all went to school. And I can tell you, I don't remember half the things my teacher taught me in high school. Math, what is that? Um, I don't use it. I went to Bible college. I didn't have to take another math class after I graduated high school. But as someone who follows another's teaching, 
that means that takes effort. That takes discipline. And like I was talking with the New Year's resolution, it's, it's a lack of discipline. You go to the gym, you have to have discipline because like I already said, it's terrible. You make a budget, you have to have discipline to stick to that budget. But being a disciple takes full commitment and discipline because it's not eating easy. Being a disciple in Christ implies that we have to have strong discipline because we're not called just to be believers. Though you can look through all the gospels and you'll see over and over again, it says, believe in me, believe in me, be a believer, but that's not the end game. We are called to be like Christ. We already created in his image, but he goes for his saying, also be like Christ, be his image to other people, imitate Christ. Romans 8, 29 says, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. The goal is to be like Christ, is to be his image. Someone stopped me after first service, says a better word than imitator is, I don't know how it should, an imagineer or an imager, like actually being Christ to other people. That is our goal. And I'll say this to youth kids all the time and my other youth groups I've worked for. When I get to heaven, I hope there's a TV. Not because I want to watch TV, but because I want to go through history. And I want to look at all these Bible stories and see how they actually happen. Like I want there to be a picture, like a movie, so I can watch it. It's just how my brain works. But I would want to look at the first church, the first, church, the first believers, what we see in Acts and in Romans. I want to go and see what their, what their time together was. Because some people, and we can look at them and say, they had a very strong radical faith. They were, ta- they were doing what they were doing in the middle of persecution, in hiding. They had a strong, radical form of Christianity, and that's what we see in the Bible. But also, I would love to talk to some of them, because I'd be like, can you watch what we, our church is today? What's your opinion on that? Chances are they may ridicule us a little bit, they may call us watered-down Christianity, and they say, well, why, are you, why is there so many denominations? Why is that word even a word? They're like, the church is supposed to be unified. We are supposed to be one unified body of believers in Christ, but why are you all fighting each other about this verse says this? This translation is better than that translation. Baptism means this. Baptism doesn't mean that. Why are you fighting over that? They could do it. Or they could say, why are you debating inside your church about, well, tradition, the way the church used to be is the way, like, hymns, the communion table in the middle of the stage, and you can't put your cup on it, or you'll get yelled at. I did that. First-hand experience. Jimmy probably yelled at me. Or the, the preacher has to be behind the massive wooden pulpits that you could hide so much stuff in, and you have to be wearing suit and tie. Or you can go to the other side that a stand is perfectly fine, the stage the stage has to have nice lights, cool design, newer music. The, pres- the performance has to be there. Short sermons can be shorter because our attention span is getting shorter. Um, and so that we can go to lunch because it's going to be noon soon and I'm hungry. And I'm saying which one's right, which one's wrong, but they could look at us and be like, you're missing the point. You are missing the point of why we come to, the, to church and we come to meet with fellow believers every time when you're worried about those things. Because like I said, it doesn't matter how many people we have in this church if we're missing the point. It doesn't matter. If we're not actively trying to be disciples and not just converts, how are we fulfilling the Great Commission? Luckily, if you say, well, Zach, what is a disciple? I'm new to this. What is a disciple? Or if you're just going to humor me today because you know all about this, say, well, you tell me what a disciple is. Well, the Bible gives us characteristics. I'm going to get everything from the Bible Today, it's not just because of what I think, but because of what I've learned myself. In John 8, 31, it says, To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So the first, one of the first characteristics is, is a disciple is someone who continues to believe everything Jesus has said and done and will continue to walk in obedience to him. He doesn't just know what Jesus has said and done, but he walks in obedience to what he had said and saw what he did and does the same thing. That's what a disciple is. A disciple isn't someone who just knows but does the same. The word used here in the Greek is translated abide, or it means to stay, but I could even take it further to continue, dwell, endure, be present, remain, or stand. Meaning we have to be people who not only study the Bible, but we also have to live by it. We have to live by what we're learning, and we have to apply that into our lives. Because being a disciple means standing firm in the word. 
because that is what being an imitator of Christ is. But there's more to being an imitator than just standing in the word. In John 13, 34 through 35, it says this, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. We are called to love. And it's not just a love of, yeah, of course. He's my friend, I love him, but it's a love that is never ceasing. It's a love, if you look at the story in the New Testament where Jesus is talking to Peter, he's testing Peter a little bit. He says, Peter, do you phileo love me? Which is like a brotherly love, a love that's just kind of there. And Peter's like, of course, of course I do. And he asks this a couple of times, but then he changes the script at the very end. He's like, Peter, do you love God they love me? Which is a never ceasing, unconditional type of love. Love that says, it doesn't matter what happens. No matter, doesn't matter what I do, do you love me that way? And Peter then, if we can see, kind of catches himself. And he's like, he sees what Jesus was doing. But this is the idea of the love that Jesus is showing us. We've already had an idea of love from the Old Testament. It says that we should love our God with everything we are, with our mind, our soul, our whole being. We should love God. But he takes it deeper. He says, no matter what someone does to you, says this is a love you need to have that you should even be willing to lay your life down for that person. Now, it's easy to say, of course, I would love that person or a parent or spouse or children or friends. I would lay my life down for them, and it's easy to love them that kind of way. Is it easy when, let's say, your older brother kicked you off the couch and you face-planted it into tile in your living room and have a bloody nose? Is it easy to love your brother at that moment? No. And if, Robbie, you're watching this, I still love you. Because he did it. It's not easy to love someone when they're beating on you or bad things are happening on you. But it's easy when someone is nice to you and they're loving you and they're bringing you things. And that's what Jesus is saying. It doesn't matter what's going on. You need to love someone in the best of times and the worst of times. And that's what being a disciple is. You need to be willing to do that even when you don't want to. So we abide in Jesus' teaching when we show the type of love that he shows us but we also need to be a disciple who is actively bearing fruit. We hear this phrase a lot in church, bearing fruit. What does that mean? Doing the works of God. It means talking to people about your faith, sharing your testimony, bringing people to church, and cultivating them to do the same to other people. That's bearing fruit. In John 15, 6 through 9, it says, If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you, now remain in my love. There's two conditions in this verse when it's talking about how we should be bearing fruit. One is that we need to abide in Jesus and that his word abides in us. And if that means if we're abiding in him, if we're true disciples and we're actively trying to, we're going to be imitators of Christ whose desires are the same desires as Christ. It doesn't just mean I'm going to be a disciple, but I'm still going to go do off and do my own thing. No, it means we have to actively be doing what God desires for us and in this world. But the other part is what we need to be doing needs to be glorifying God. When we're bearing fruit, it needs to bring glory to God. We know you can glorify God through worship and praise. But he goes there saying, by bearing fruits continuously, and that's not just an occasional good deed like I helped my next door neighbor mow their lawn or I brought someone to church with me this week. It's not just that. It's a continuous bearing of fruit that's always advancing the kingdom of God. And that shows the signs of being a disciple and that's what brings glory to God in that way. In Matthew 5, 16, it says, In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your heaven and Father. John 15, 1 through 2 says, I am the true vine and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that bears fruit he prunes, so it'll be even more fruitful. We are called to continuously show people who God is through your actions, your words, how you treat them, how you don't treat them. That is what being a disciple is. We are called to bear fruit. We are called to strive to be different because if we don't, the Bible says it easy. God prunes us. He chops us off and throws us in the fire. That doesn't sound good to me, we have to be actively trying to be disciples. So being disciples, like I said, is teaching others of Christ, biding in his word, having the love for others that Christ loves us, that he did what he did for us, and it's also by being someone who bears fruit. Now, understanding what being a disciple is is all good, and it gives us direction, but there's a little catch 
that I want to throw out is being a true disciple, being in true discipleship is there's a cost. It's not something that's free. We get to where we're at because God did what he did for us and we don't have to pay God for what he did for anything, but being his disciples will cost us. In Luke 14, 25 through 33, it says this, large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to him, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those who do not give up everything, you cannot be my disciples. This verse is pretty, pretty straightforward when you look at it. It's just, there's things that are going to cost us. By being a disciple, you know what? There's going to be some conflict in your life. People may look at you and say, do you really love your family? Because it seems like you love God more to where that's where the, you must hate your family. Is that The love difference is just crazy that people could think you hate your family. Secondly, we have to carry up our crosses daily. It just doesn't mean when you want to or when life is good and hide when life is bad. It means every single day you have to put in the effort. And I love the story that he gives there. I don't know how many of you ever try to build something. I'm not good at building things. It's just not my forte. I try and it just never goes right. You have to estimate how much it's going to cost, what, what you're going to do, the plans, all of it. You have to look at that because if you start something and you don't finish it, people will laugh at you. Meaning, they're like, how could you not finish it? It was so simple. Or going to war. I've never been to war. I don't want to go to war. But it's the same thing. When you're about to enter a war, you have to look at the costs. Could I win this war with what I have and where I'm going? Could I win this war? If not, don't waste lives and just try to find out other ways around. In Luke 9, 56 through, no, 9, 59 through 60, he said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Or Matthew 10, 34 through 35, do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. These two passages show us that true discipleship, like I said, someone who is actively trying to be a disciple can bring conflict into our personal lives. But doesn't these costs seem worth it? Doesn't these costs seem worth it considering the reward that we would be get, we will get by entering the world of being a disciple of Christ? Because some believe that life will, some believe that in our lifetimes we will see great persecution. If you look how the world's going, I think it's safe to say the church isn't going to be as safe as the church has been recently in the near future. I think we are called to stand out of this society and be different, that it's going to put targets on our backs. I mean, how many years ago did we have all these lawsuits and fines coming against Christian bakers who are telling people, no, I'm not baking a cake for you? They were losing their business or they were getting fined or even the possibility of jail. They even took the fact, how many ministers were being told, if you don't perform certain weddings, you're gonna, your church could lose your tax exemption, which eh, you could get by without it, or you're going to be fined or you could face jail time for just simply saying no because I don't believe in that. The target was laid. We are going to face persecution. Luke 9, 23 through 27 says, He said to all of them, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when it comes in his glory 
and in the glory of the Father and the, of the holy angels. Truly I tell you, someone who are, some of you who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. Like I said, our lives are not guaranteed to be easy. We will suffer and endure persecution, and some maybe even to the life, to death for Christ. I mean, we're going through Revelation. If you take Revelation as something that is going to happen, it tells us it's going to happen. Things are going to change. We're going to go through this because the society is changing to where we are being very different. We can be ridiculed because of what we believe in a society that doesn't believe what we are going to believe. But to be a disciple, Jesus needs to have complete control of your life in all of this, in all this craziness and turmoil. Your life has to be in complete control and reigned by the person we're supposed to be like. In Luke 14, 27, it says, and whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. He's, he's saying, I have to be in control. For me, I'm a big advocate of CIY. I've said this last service. I will always say, if you have middle schoolers, high schoolers, send them to CIY events. It's not just a time for them to get away from you and to have fun and sleep in college dorms or go to camps and eat as much junk food as their parents let them pack or buy at gas stations on their way so their parents don't know. These events cause impact in people's lives. I wouldn't be standing here even thinking about preaching a sermon if it wasn't for CIY. I wanted to be a high school music director when I was in high school before CIY events. Thank the Lord I didn't go do that because that sounds really boring now. But that's what I wanted to do. But CIY events, every year, they're set up the same. They build you up. They tear you down, make you cry, make you realize the things that you need to do. But there was this one year, the skit that has stuck with me. I don't know, I think I was in middle school when I saw this skit, but it's stuck with me for years now. It was of a guy standing next to a stool. And on the other side of the stool was Jesus. And he says, Jesus, hey, this stool is my life. It represents my life. Every decision that will be made, everything I do is from this stool. Will you take control of my life and sit down in this stool? And of course, Jesus says, yes, I would love to do that. And he sits down. And it seems great, right? Oh yeah, the skit ended. It's a it's great imagery. But then life starts happening to this guy. And you can probably guess what happens next. He goes over to stool and kind of just side scoots Jesus off to school, stool and says, I'm taking my life back. And Jesus is standing over there. And he's like, what are you? And, he, and so it happens again, over and over again. The guy's like, God's like, you're right, right. Take the stool. You control it. Life happens. He scoots it. We do the same things. Even when we are trying to be true disciples, we let life control us to where we try to skew out of being what we need to be because discipleship has a high cost and sometimes that makes people walk away who aren't ready to pay that price. And like I said it over and over again, Jesus, I believe, sometimes values quality before quantity. And in life, that's what we need to do. We need to be willing to put that blind faith and who we are trying to be like to control our lives, to let them have reins over it, because that is what being a disciple is. Because the rewards of living a life in true discipleship with true disciples, imitating Christ brings great rewards. And these rewards are, are first future blessings. In Romans 5, 9, it says, Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Revolution, revel, oh gosh, I said that first service too. Revelation 21, 1 through 8, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth has passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city and the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no mourning, crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He was seated on the throne and said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, or, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of, spring of the water of life. Those who are virtuous will inherit all of this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children." But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. 
John 14, 27 says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. John 4, 13 through 18 says, Jesus answered, Everyone who thinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I will give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. We have these rewards. It's all talking about things that are coming, the things that we'll never be thirsty again, or we will have this, this just rush of things running through us. We're in time where death, mourning, tears, pain, getting old, all of it is going to disappear. And that is the reward for the cost. But how do we get there? How, how do we take the cost and how do we get the reward? And this is where I'm going to put a selfish plug because of the role I have in the church. One of the ways is to join small groups. I think the Bible perfectly examples how we should do discipleship, and that is with other believers and like-minded people in Christ. Because growing your faith and being a disciple is not just something you do on your own. If you look at the church in Acts, they perfectly show us how they do it. They met with each other. They broke bread. They worshiped. They fellowshiped. But they also met each other's needs. They did all of this. And that is what being a disciple is, is when you gather with like-minded people and you have a relationship with them. And that's why small groups are so great. And if you aren't a part of one and you want to be a part of one, come talk to me. I would love to plug you into one, or if you think you would like to start a small group, I'm also always willing to people to start more small groups, and we'll talk about that, because I'm 100% sold in, and I know people say, people say, well, I'm sold in on small groups, well, I like Bible studies, but it doesn't matter which one you like. It matters is, are you being like God, being with other people, taking the time to help each other grow, to learn what the Bible says, to be there for each other to help each other grow because that is what it is we see that with jesus and his 12 disciples those guys knew everything about each other the bible doesn't tell us exactly if that's true or not but if you're traveling with someone for three and a half years eating together traveling together sleeping together doing all those miracles together i guarantee you would know everything about that person it's just nature. If you're that close to someone, you learn everything about them. We need to be doing the same. We need to be knowing someone's suffering. We need to celebrate someone in their success because that's what it is. But discipleship, I keep saying this, takes time. It's not an express mail mentality where you can order it one day and get it the next. That's not what it is. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes studying. It takes failure. It takes success. It takes all of those things to do it. Let me put it this way. I don't know how many of you play golf, I'm not good at golf. I enjoy playing golf. But for a couple summers in between college, I worked on a golf course. Probably one of the most boring jobs I've ever had. And just because you're sweating all day outside, so it was terrible. But I did not enjoy mowing the greens. It was not a fun job. Because if you ever play golf, if you mess up a green, you're going to have hundreds of golfers playing that course later that day mad at whoever mowed that green. They may not know who the person is, but they are going to be mad at how that green was mowed. Because if you scalp the green or you make wiggly lines, it changes how the ball plays. It just does. I don't understand it. It's grass. If you mow grass, it's grass. How does it change how the ball plays? But it does. And they get mad over it. So I was taught by whoever taught me that you pick a, f- just you fix your eyes on a certain point and walk to that point. Don't take your eyes off it. They told me don't blink, but I'm like, I can't keep my eyes open that long. But keep your eyes fixed at a certain point because if you do that, you're going to walk a straight line. That's all good and dandy if you pick a good focus point. If you pick a moving branch and the branch is doing this, guess what's going to happen? You're going to have wiggly lines because you're going to be like... And then you're just naturally going to do that. But if you pick a a thick, not-moving tree... I just blanked out. If you pick a tree, not a moving branch, and you walk towards that spot on the tree, guess what? You are going to have straight lines. not saying you may not hit a pebble that got kicked up in the green, or you may shift a little bit, but it's going to be a lot straighter if you focus on a sturdy point. In our lives, we can take our lives just like we do mowing a green. I hope you never have to mow a green, but if you do, there you go. I taught you how to make, mow straight lines on a green. But we have to do this in our spiritual life. It is. You have to focus on a solid point. 
Not focusing on, oh, the new trend in the church or the new big preacher or the new mega church that's popped up somewhere. Those are all good and dandy, but they can change. They'll move. And if you just keep moving, your lines are going to be very wiggly. But if you focus on the cornerstone, you focus on a point that is the same every single day, has been for hundreds of years, and will continue to be there, the same solid rock tomorrow and in the future, which is Jesus and God, they are there. They are never going to change. They are always going to be stationary, and they're going to just be a point that you can focus on. Your lines are going to be straight. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. I'm not saying you're not going to mess up every now and then, but on this road to true discipleship, where you focus on is going to make all of the difference. And that's God. That's the Bible. That's all of these things help you focus on the end goal. The end goal isn't to stay in this world forever. We're called to be different from the world. We're not called to be of the world. We're told that you're going to stand out in the world and people are going to look at you weird, and that's okay. As long as we're focused on a certain point, nothing else matters. And I hope you can do that because it is not, it's not easy. There's costs. There's going to be struggles. There's going to be times that you want to give up because being a true disciple, being someone who's in discipleship is not easy. That's why people walk away and say, I'm done. I, I give up but you have to stick it through because the award outweighs the cost. Lord, thanks for staying to us where we can come here and we can just learn about you. We can learn about what you call us to do and what you want for our lives and the rewards that you give even if there is cost. Continue to let us just live a life that is honoring to you and is glorifying you in everything we do and continue to let us keep our eyes focused on you because if we do, nothing else matters we won't move, we won't waver, and we'll stay strong in you and everything we do. In Jesus' name, amen.